Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. Today, we're happy to welcome Kim, Senior Portfolio Manager at the Export and Investment Fund of Denmark, formerly known as Vexfonden, a Danish growth fund that he joined in 2017. Kim has been supporting numerous Danish startups with venture debt and growth loans in collaboration with both investors and other venture debt lenders, offering a great overview on tech lending. If you enjoy our content, do support us by hitting the follow button, giving us a review and following the European VC on LinkedIn. Kim, welcome to the European VC. We're so happy to have you with us. Yeah, hello, hello. Excited to be here. Yeah, so am I, because Kim, we've known each other for some time. You uh, have had different roles in the ecosystem. I've always said, Kim, we need to bring you on the podcast. And I'm so happy that we're finally doing it. But Kim, now you're with Vexfunden and you've been there before as well. And I'd love to hear your take on Vexfunden. What is Vexfunden? What are you doing for the Danish ecosystem? I think, you know, given that our audience are... GPs in the ecosystem, many of them have even considered raising capital from Vexfund because it started to rumor that Vexfund also does fund investments outside of Denmark. That's not the branch you're in, but I'd love to, you know, kind of get that overall overview of what is Vexfund and what should our European audience in the VC space know about Vexfund. Yeah, sure. So, and just a side note, so some would know that we're in the midst of a merger, so we're actually changing our name in this period, but let's still call it Vexfund. Vexfund is supporting the Danish tech ecosystem in three ways. We're doing investments in, in funds acting as LP. Then we're doing direct investments, placing equity in somewhat a typical uh, VC way. And then on the third hand, we are doing lending towards the tech ecosystem. So as I would call tech lending, a way of doing loans with an approach that would not fit into a typical banking approach. Yeah. And that, of course, is as we teased in the intro, the topic of today. So we'll dive super deep there. But Kim, before we go into that topic, let's just hear your route into venture, where you're coming from and what you've been doing these last 10 years. Yeah. Originally, I've evolved from corporate banking actually found my way into Vexfund in 2017 and got my eyes open for the whole tech and VC ecosystem, which I didn't know that much about before joining Vexfund. So that was actually quite amazing for me in, in those first years to experience those hyper growth companies and how to fund them actually. And this was still in the very early days of uh, venture debt and tech lending in not only Denmark, but I would think in, in Europe as a whole. So it's been quite exciting to f- follow how this system has evolved over the past four, five, six years, and also how we could fit into that and develop our own products to serve the Danish tech startups and, and scale-ups. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been quite a journey. And also anyone at least, so you're primarily writing in Danish, am I right in saying that? In the like articles or blog? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've been doing both, but primarily in Danish. It's, that's true. Yeah. But if anyone's really into tech lending, I think that it's worthwhile you going in and finding him on LinkedIn, connecting with him and uh, following his writing, because I do think that this is a under-described topic in European VC. So for that reason, I'm enjoying at least following it. And you know, by now, our, <laughs> our Google Translates are, are of good enough quality that it doesn't really matter what the original language is. So. Kim, may I just literally ask, do you agree with what Andrea just said? Do you see it that it's a topic that is still somewhat underexplored slash not fully understood by scale-up founders themselves? as well uh yeah definitely and like as a whole it isn't described in the academic world yet as well it's still so premature i would imagine that in in the coming years and decades we will have a lot more literature about this a lot more data like for instance some argue that a lot of venture debt funds they have higher returns than like an average vc fund now i might provoke some someone here i don't know But I've heard it several times. I haven't been able to find any data or literature about this. But when I look at our portfolio, I think it could be true. That's an interesting perspective. And I think it also goes to show that it's a different instrument, right? And thus there are different dynamics. It's a different asset class altogether, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not even equity. <laughs> now, I was about to say that if we just talk about it for a second from the LP perspective, you should not be expecting outlier returns from a venture lending provider, which is exactly what you should be hoping for, at least 
from the VC portfolio that you have. Yeah. The fact of the matter is that many VCs maybe shouldn't be funded for that, <laughs> that reason. We, we don't have good average performance. And of course, to anyone listening, that's of course not your fund. It's all the other. <laughs> <laughs> nope. But, but that way of putting it, Andreas, that is like some core in this as well, because a venture capital fund would always look at the upside, at the, the high growth journey, where yeah. a venture debt lender would look at the bottom of the case. What's the base? All right, Kim, give us the overview on tech lending as an asset class or as an offering to founders. Tell us what's important to understand for our audience. Yeah, wow, huge question. <laughs> Trying to start out from scratch. Tech lending is a way of financing where you do a loan or something similar to a loan for a typically young company with typically high growth rates that is not able to go to the bank and have a loan there. So the funding provider needs to put another view on this company. They need to look at other metrics and data in order to assess the loan and structure the loan and how large the loan should be, actually. That's like the short definition of it, I would say. And then you said, well, Andreas, what to be aware of? Maybe we should start with some history in this as well. Venture as a term has, to my awareness, been there for like the 1970s or 80s, evolved in the valley, and then matured up till the dot-com bubble. And then from that on, it started to be more in the way we see it today, actually, structured and pricing as we see today, and the assessment approach the way we see it today. U.S. is those one decade or 10 years ahead of Europe. So in Europe, we've seen tens like 2010, 12, 14. We began to see for real like the first venture debt lenders putting their foot down in Europe and doing deals. Silicon Valley Bank entered the U.K. in 2012. In Denmark, I believe we saw the first deals in 2015, 16, when we introduced our venture debt product at Vexfunden in 2018, I believe maybe two, three, four deals had been made in Denmark at that time. So naturally, like the venture debt activity and system rides on the back of the VC activity. And that's like the venture debt loans, typically maturity of three, four years, what I would call a long-term loan. Then there's also the term revenue-based financing that I would also touch upon when talking about the heading tech lending. We've seen that evolve very much in just the past two, three years in in Europe and in Denmark. It has been also in in the US. Again, they are a bit ahead of us. But the revenue-based financing product, some would call it loan, some would call it equity, some would say it's in between because it's it's neither or. Yeah, I don't know what I would call it, but but it's, it's a way of financing that is quite different from venture debt because it's short term. It's not the same strict uh, covenants and collateral and so on. So often it's much quicker and easier to apply, but also often, how to say, put all the costs together. RBF lending would often be more expensive than than venture debt, but still cheaper than an equity, right? That should be like how you would would prioritize. And how about stage-wise? When is venture debt and revenue-based financing relevant? Is it already at the pre-seed seed stage or is it more for the growth stage? So first of all, important thing is that the company should obviously have product market fit, but also have like the scalability ready, you should have some kind of predictability in your numbers because with a loan, the thing is you need to pay the money back, right? It's not as with equity where you can just pour more money into the business. With loans, there is a limit because it has to be paid back. When talking about venture debt, the typical thing is we've seen them enter after an, an classic A round. During the past years, we've also seen venture debt funds enter after seed round or something that would look like seed rounds. And the main thing is here, like there are three ways in which you can pay back a loan. You could pay back the loan with cash from the operations. You could pay back the loan with a future equity round or with an exit. So depending on where you are on the journey and how your projections look, this should be a determinant for are we ready to take on a loan and how much should we take on, right? But venture it from seed A round, RBF a bit, more subjective, I would say, because often they could be like much smaller lines and and tied up to a monthly revenue. So often, in some cases, we would see them enter earlier on, but the money has to be paid back often after a short period of time, maybe four, six, eight months. Do you see big differences between how the venture debt tech lending, to be a bit broader, industry is operating in, in Europe and the US? And I ask this because probably 99% of what I've read on the topic is US-centric. Yeah. In terms of how the deals are structured, yeah. How the terms of each deal, how the money's paid back, how you know 
the different periods of the payback period were, you know, all of that. And I wonder, is it quite similar the way the industry is operating in Europe compared to the US or do we see some structural differences? I think we do. This is correlated to that the US ecosystem is just that more mature, right? So you have more data to base your deal and, and risk assessment on. What I've experienced is that typically the deals made in the US are at a pricing level lower than Europe. The cost for a rented loan consists of fees, interests, and a warrant. And if you look at both the fees and the interest rates, I definitely think that they are lower in the US. Interest rate maybe two, three percent points lower, actually, and fees also way lower. Then on the other side, my experience is that combined with a lower pricing level, it's more common to use financial covenants on on USD. So you set up this set of rules in which the company has to operate within on the financial numbers. And if you trail outside this ballpark, well, then actually the loan would trigger a default. That's what you sign for, actually. And obviously, this sets some limitations and a risk to the company, which you should be aware of. So it has a price to pay this lower interest rate and fee, right? That, that is just to put it up a bit black and white. Yeah, yeah, and we'll dive much more into that in a second. I just wanted to double click on what you said in terms of tech lending being cheaper for the founders in the US versus here in Europe, because you tend to say, looking at it from the investor perspective, you know, you're used to say that the deals are more expensive in the US when you're talking equity than it is in Europe. But if you then reverse that to lending, well, then it should be the same, right? But it's not. Yeah, and that's a very good point. Well, the difference in cost between raising an equity round and a venture debt round, it's going the opposite way. Yeah, <laughs> you're actually yeah. saying. I think actually you're correct, Andreas. I've never thought about that, but I think you're right. Still, I would argue that the loan would be cheaper. Otherwise, if it isn't cheaper, it has no relevance on the balance sheet. Yeah. I have one question more on, and I'll let David take us into some of the more provocative questions that him and I have been considering around tech lending. But I'd love to understand how you think about tech lending in the European landscape. Is it competitive enough or are we missing players? And for that reason, you know, a bit too expensive on the founder side, or at least it's it's more expensive than it necessarily had to. How do you see it? Or do we have enough active players and also, if we have any worthwhile mentions that are active across Europe, do name them because many in our audience would, would like to just have them top of mind. Yeah, sure. When I found my way into this space back in 2017, 18, we did a mapping and counted around 20 active players in, in Europe. Some of them based in Europe, but also U.S. funds putting their feet down in Europe and hunting deals in Europe. Through the past four or five years, I haven't done the math, but I would think that this number has four or five X actually. We have seen a lot of new players entering and just as well as we see a lot of the larger US VC funds placing their money in, in European startups, we also see US venture debt lenders increasingly targeting P and now yeah, Danish tech scale-ups. The, the ecosystem is maturing in a way where we see term and structures adjusting and developing over time. And this is very interesting. Like coming from a corporate banking world, I've always thought to myself, why don't we see any of the larger banks doing some side of yeah, side vehicle or just finding their way in this space? I still think we haven't, at least for now, for real, seen some of the larger Danish banks and for real also some of the larger European banks entering, finding their way into this space. We've seen Barclays, but we won Deutsche Bank trying as well. But like you can't talk about this without mentioning Silicon Valley Bank, right? They are like the fathers of fathers and mothers of this yeah and to our audience we are recording this on the 10th of march which means it's literally the day where the news broke that silicon bank are in trouble we will not comment on that because it's too much of a developing story for us to be able to say something that won't make us look stupid in five hours <laughs> really so, so for that reason we're sorry not to be commenting on what's probably still a developing story this episode goes out just adding that in there but yes absolutely silicon valley bank have been Hugely important in this space. We should add one note to your philosophical question of why aren't the other major normal banks venturing into this space? Well, I'm guessing that Silicon Valley Bank will kind of be 
is something that will prove some of them right, that this is a difficult space and you really need to know what you're doing. And Silicon Valley Bank have always been very specialized in terms of servicing the venture and startup ecosystem. There is increasing activity and a huge focus and money from outside Europe, dropping into Europe, definitely. Pitchbook made an analysis back in, I think, late 21, where it was oh, very visible that the venture debt activity was growing actually significantly more than the VC activity in the past two, three years at that time. And maybe to uh, just to go back to the other question you had just before, Andreas, on the cost side of it, just a side note on that. I think the cost on doing an equity round might be more fluctuating than doing a loan. Uh, loans deal. And the cost is, I would say, significantly higher now as valuations have dropped, right? So that's also a variable in this math. So Kim, I've been looking forward to asking you a couple of questions, mainly around like topics that are typically raised as critiques, let's put it like that, <laughs> to tech lending or misconceptions or areas that are misunderstood. So one topic is like the overhang topic, right? This concept that going for the venture debt creates overhang for the next round. A couple of minutes ago, you said, you know, there's different scenarios of how you can pay back. And one of those is effectively the next round, right? So, okay, makes sense. Things seem to add up. And here I'm just kind of echoing, I'll call it a rant, <laughs> by a prominent VC in the US and kind of just there to read and quote a bit here. He says, I don't really understand how it makes sense for lenders or for founders, to be honest. I think the whole industry doesn't make any sense for founders. I don't like it because money has to be paid back right as debt. So founders take in this venture debt thinking like it's an equity round, but without dilution or some more ones. And they don't realize, well, wait a second, we've got to pay this back in a year or a year and a half. And here, parentheses, I don't know if this is standard in Europe, this period, I don't think so, but you can comment on that. That creates an overhang because the new VC is coming in. They want their money to go into the company, not to pay off a bank. Love to hear your comment on that, Kim. Yeah, thanks. Great question, David. And these are really key points in this because obviously doing a debt facility, that's more powder for the existing cap table. And who pays for that? Well, that's the future investors coming into the company, right? You could put it up that way. So the exercise is to do this in a way where we're balancing it with not too much debt and also in a structure and a timeline that would fit into a future equity funding plan. This is so, so important. I think when doing a loan and you're a growing company dependent on future equity as well, you need to be very, very aware of how much debt you take on your balance sheet. We have seen examples. We've also, like, to be honest, where I am looking back, we have seen examples where we've, in good faith, actually, we've put too much debt on a company at that given time. And by that, making it harder to raise yeah. that next round when you're not materializing your budgets and projections. And it's, yeah, that's just common, right? That's not unusual. So you need to be aware of how much debt you take on and what's the structure of this debt. And most importantly of all, how is the cash flow for the deal, right? Yeah. Can I ask you just to comment on it also from the perspective of CapEx intensive businesses, mm -hmm. right? Because that's something I've heard and I've always thought it's a really interesting merge of the two where equity investing isn't necessarily well suited to finance CapEx intensive operations. Venture Lab actually feels like it is, right? So there's also, from my perspective, there's different ways you think about, as a founder, right? You think about where the cash is coming from and what's its funding, right? So if you need to build up stock because you have electric scooters or whatever, I've always seen venture debt playing an interesting role there, but I'm not an expert. So I'd love to hear you comment from that perspective as well. Like doing loan financing for CapEx, that is like the old way of thinking. It's still very suitable for that. But the main thing is that you, with venture debt, you finance future organic growth or acquisitions maybe. So you extend whatever you have now, and then you can draw a line and see predictable metrics from, from that on. And then you actually, what you put a loan into is the future cash flows more than it's some kind of asset. Still, you would need to have collateral in that asset because that de-risks the deal as a whole, right? That's not the core argument for doing the deal. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, very much. Could I ask you, Kim? So in startup land, there's always the issue that a pre-seed founder is typically quite less sophisticated than the VC in terms of the terms. <laughs> and that sometimes have founders doing something they shouldn't be doing, right? This is much, much more complex. And the typical toolbox of business manager oftentimes is heavy on financing. But in the startup world, we tend to have less 
business savvy or you know financiers in the executive teams. So in a way, I could imagine that there's very, very difficult not to end up in a situation where you're kind of selling candy to children in a sense, right? It, that you really need to be aware of your own role. And now you're coming from Vexfund, which means, of course, you're not there to be a vulture. But I imagine that a founder can very, very quickly end in the hands of a vulture when they're doing venture debt-like structures. Am I right in saying that? And how do you think about that? Yeah, I get your point on your question. And definitely, like many of the founders and the startups, it's the first time they do this kind of financing. They've never tried doing a loan with a bank, and they definitely never tried to do to venture debt. But most often, we would have people on the cap table or, and or at the board with experience in this. Maybe some of them know this lender beforehand. Often, actually, that is like the way for a venture debt lender into a company that is knowing core parts the of the, the exactly core parts of the cap table. So, like the founders should use their investors or the people they have around them to guide them and to consult in this matter, definitely. And then also, I would argue that they should have a lawyer on their side to go through the documentation part of it. But even, you know, the lawyer can help you with understanding it, right? But then applying that to your quite complex startup business side of it, commercial side of it, is not the lawyer's toolbox, right? No, true. Adding to that, and you should try and have references with an investor that you are thinking of engaging with, you should do the same with a venture debt lender. Even though the venture debt lender would not be as close to you and on the board, it's still a partnership through many years where you should be able to talk together and you should have a belief that this lender would have good morals and should have some kind of awareness of how would this company and, and these persons act when things maybe not turn out as, as we planned, maybe things go out and what happens in that scenario. This can be, if you do the right work beforehand, have references on this lender, this can bring very valuable insights to this coming partnership that are actually, maybe they would mean more actually than the hardcore cost. Another topic I wanted to raise here, Kim, is this topic of, you know, venture debt tech lending, generally speaking, a great way to increase your runway, but this kind of argument, which it's not really taking equity risk. So it's a different type of runway, right? And again, let me quote and hear the argument being right that since the lender is not taking equity risk, they never want to be the last six months of your runway. <laughs> it's going to be the first six months. So just to paint a clear picture, and I'm quoting here, the other thing about it is that a lender is not getting an equity reward. So they don't want to take equity risk. They may be getting a nice, you know, coupon. I might be getting 9% or something like that. Again, between brackets here, this is my comment, probably US centric, this comment, which sounds high for that, but they're not taking true equity risk in the company. So the last thing they want to do is be your last six months of runway. They want to be your first six months of runway and then get paid off on the back end. And I think a lot of founders think, oh, I'll take this money and I'll send my runway for 18 months or two years. But what will happen is in the last six months, there's all of a sudden a bank that will come your way and activate whatever it's called, a covenant or whatever. And the founders just kind of not realizing they signed themselves off of that flexibility. Again, would love to hear your comment on that. Yeah, very, very relevant question. And actually yeah, adds to the question we just had before, because you need a lender that would be flexible and in for it in the long term. So when you look 18 or 24 months ahead and plans have not materialized, we don't need a lender that would stay on the original repayment yeah. schedule before everyone else. If you have a situation where everyone needs to tap something into the bucket to handle some, yeah, some, some situation. And I think that's the core part of knowing what lender you engage with. It is very, very important that you have some kind of patience and flexibility with the lender. I have seen situations where, yeah, lenders act very differently in these scenarios, both in regards to how flexible are they postponing payment schedule and extending the total duration of the loan, and also what fees do they require when changing the original facility. And I think that is key points you need to look into as a founder when doing a deal, because often, most often they're not described in any documentation or, or materials that you receive. This is like knowing your yeah. opponent actually and you're true a venture lender will not take equity risk that's true but still if you have a situation where some gap needs to be filled and the relevant investors tap in with their pro rata and you have a lender that is also significant in the funding journey well then they need to do something yeah. as well and when you say flexibility there's so you connected it a lot to extra capital needs but there's also the point of 
you know, the last thing you want as a founder is to have to consult your bank with every kind of business change you make and you're, you're derailing a bit from plan. Not that you need extra capital, that just things have changed, right? And that also goes in a lot of what you're saying, right? That flexibility goes beyond just the capital need. It also goes into like business planning, you know, how we're executing on everything, blah, blah, et cetera, right? Yeah, exactly. And it also goes the other way around because you shouldn't expect as a founder and also as investors to, if you need something to be filled, a gap to be filled, you shouldn't expect the lender to be the, the only one to do something here. It's an agreement all the way around the table. Yeah. Do you see other kind of critiques to the model in your day-to-day -day business? Do you see VCs coming up with stuff they don't like about the tech lending model or even founders? Any tips or stories you could share? One thing I would mention is back to this balancing how much debt at the given time we have seen examples where venture debt lenders are very eager to do a deal and then quantum becomes at one parameter that they would try to get the deal with and then you would fill in too much debt into the company and from founder side it's flattering to have that article heading saying well i've raised this much money right but that could trigger a negative events later on I recall like back in 2017, 18, when I found my way into this and trying to figure out, well, how much debt? What is the right yeah. quantum here? I call having a call with, with a US VC where he said, well, Kim, $1 of ARR equals $1 of debt. I thought to myself, is it that simple? Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's easy math. Let's go out and play. <laughs> exactly. But I think in some cases that could be the correct balance, but there is more to it than that. The most important things are future cash flows from the operations and believing in future XP rounds, right? So having an awareness of what are the levels of ARR is one thing, but also how fast are we growing and how much are we burning? And why are we burning? Are we burning for the organic growth or are we burning to develop products to have the awareness of growth rates and burn and what the burn consists of, that is very important when doing the math of how much debt. In some cases, only uh, like half of the ARR as would be the correct level. And in some cases, you could go beyond one-to-one. -one. I have seen examples <laughs> way above one-to-one. -one. I was literally going to ask you about that because and it's funny that you brought it up because I was literally going to say, well, if you only look at ARR and you don't look at burn rate as an example, right, among many other metrics, then it would oscillate as much as early stage investing does, right? Because <laughs> then it would shift with yeah. market sentiment. And it, as you said, right, it actually doesn't. It's much more stable. But then, David, when talking about this, also taps into another perspective here. And that is that tech lending, and maybe not venture that as a term, but tech lending, doing loans for high growth companies. This is always also relevant for non-VC funded companies. So a company growing 25, 30, 40% a year, still burning cash, might not be able to go to the bank. They're not like a darling for a VC. Maybe other investors already, but a typical VC wouldn't be able to see their 10x over the next five years. But growing a bit slower also means lower burn rate. And this makes it much easier to see future cash flows from the operations paying back the loan. And in that matter, the lending product could be very, very relevant. I have one final question before we go to the quick fire round. And that is just to ask you, Kim, if our listeners are thinking, I want to seek out more knowledge about this space, what would be the key resources and people to follow? Aside, for, aside from Kim using Google Translate, of course. Yes, aside from that very simple, <laughs> simple exercise of activating Google Translate on LinkedIn. That's actually a good question. So I recall myself doing a lot of Googling years ago, still doing it. And there are some, I think if you just Google venture debt, you would see articles coming up, a lot of well-known names in the VC. SVB um, has a lot of, a lot of space, content, actually. SVB has a lot, exactly. And like all the, most of the venture debt lenders, they have their own blogs. I've seen Nathan Ladka, for instance, he's done some analysis and blogs around this subject. There are a couple of more, Thomas Tunkus also, but they will show up just by Googling. Yeah. That's with yeah. everything else, right? <laughs> I have one. Nah, but no one Googles anymore. So now it's if ChatGPT doesn't have the... Uh, so <laughs> true. We should try that. I haven't tried it, actually. <laughs> we will put out a transcript of, uh, of this just via ChatGPT. No, <laughs> so I have one follow-up question to that, which is, am I not right in saying that the tech lenders are all of a profile where if a VC wants to educate themselves on this, they would be able to reach out to the major tech lenders that you mentioned before and then, you know, you're obviously in the hands of the vultures. <laughs> so they'll be selling your stuff. But 
you would definitely be able to educate yourself by uh, reaching out to that group and they would be more than interested because that's the typical route to new clients. Definitely. The VCs that have been there in the game for many years, they would already have partnerships and friendships with venture developers. So. Yeah, and so I'm more thinking about all our emerging managers to whom this might be a new space. How do you start building up this knowledge base? So yeah. Kim, we always end our episodes with a quick fire round is when I ask quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. So let's get it started. And my first question for you today and slightly different to what we normally ask is, what would be your top tips for emerging VCs across Europe who are looking to build relations with tech vendors. What we just said, reach out and ask. But also, I think when you do deals with venture debt lenders, that is when you really get to know them. So if you are not doing a deal yourself, ask others what are their impressions, what are their experiences, because only by that you would know how, how the different actors, they act in, in given situations. My next question, I normally ask to all our guests, you know, what's most counterintuitive learning in venture? So I'm going to ask you a similar question, which is what has been your most counterintuitive learning since you've been in the tech lending space? I think in the years I've been working with this, I've come across very different opinions on whether you should raise that or not and how much actually. And thinking of like the one day meeting EC saying, well, I would never have my portfolio companies raising debt. And then... The next day you meet a company where they would say, I would always do this. Then thinking of having a cap table where you would have both these VCs on board, that could bring some discussions in the boardroom, right? <laughs> so I think it's important for a founder to, each time you bring on a new investor to the cap table, have this conversation with the investors as well. Well, how do you think of debt funding? Yeah. It's a subject where you need to be aligned. Yeah. Somewhat aligned, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. And it also goes to show the maturity slash immaturity of the space, right? Because if you have a space like this where there's that divided opinions, it's typically because, you know, it's not mature enough for consensus to have arisen yet. Because it doesn't make sense that you have something, that instrument that divides so much, right? It would have different purposes and it would fit for different circumstances, and for that reason, you'd have differing perspectives. But it doesn't make sense to be a VC that then says either I love it and I'll have it in all my companies or a VC that says I hate it and I won't ever have it, right? It fits in different stages. Am I right in saying that, Kim? Is that how you think about it as well? I think you're right. And also, like, you need to be aware of the different interests around the cap table because obviously some investors or some persons around the cap table would be more interested in doing debt financing than others. But still, you need to, in every funding event you need to get an agreement all the way around right yeah absolutely kim thanks so much for joining us this was a blast most technical conversation we've had for a while i think but you know our uh, podcast is the most nerdy place to go for someone in vc so thanks a million kim uh likewise and i actually i wanted it to be even more technical but <laughs> so <laughs> funny to hear you say that but um thanks for having me it was very fun thank you for listening to this episode of the european vc the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc.